Two weeks ago, we sort of uh, we sort of wrapped up our look at what the writer of the Church Reset book, that's the book that I am using the most with this, calls Business Like Churches. And I think the takeaways from our discussion on that subject might be summarized kind of like this. And this is a summary kind of of what we've talked about. Western culture has an affinity for business-like organizational plans. It's kind of ingrained in us in so many ways it's difficult for us to think of it in any other way. Secondly, we have a propensity in Western Christian circles to organize our churches much like we organize everything else in Western culture in a business-like fashion. Third, we understand that in Western culture we need to have some aspects of the business model. We've talked about that in class for our church organizations, budgets and internal organizational structures and meetings, finance, all of that are part of the business model, but they're very much needed, I think, in today's society. So we don't want to throw the business model out entirely. There are things we need to do in regard to that. Um, we even see aspects of the business model, I think, in the New Testament in the form of elders, deacons, organization, ministries, division of responsibilities. There's even some finance involved planning meetings and so on. You see all of that in the New Testament. And so you, you, don't, you don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. You, you, there are some things that, that we need and that I think we saw in the New Testament in terms of business-type structure. However, some church organizations we believe, and this, this book actually believes as well, carry the business model further than maybe it should with over-reliance, and I'm going to stress over-reliance, on some aspects of church life that tend to promote a provider and customer relationship rather than a family relationship, and that's where all of this is going. You know, we, if we see ourselves as customers and we see those on staff and in leadership as providers, maybe we're looking at more of the business model of the church than we ought to. Uh, this is not a retail business. It's not a it's not a wholesale business, it's not a shop, it's not a place where you go to, to buy something or to get something. Um, this is a place where family meets. Um, you know, and some of the things that churches tend to overly rely on, and again, I'm going to stress overly rely on our church programs, preaching and teaching, paid staff, marketing, uh, church programs to keep the members busy and engaged, preaching and teaching to provide all or most of a member's spiritual needs, and if you remember, we talked about uh, we we talked about uh, doing that kind of thing on your own, uh, uh, and that when we get into the business-like model of church, we tend to say, okay, what happens during the week? Nobody else needs to know. I don't have to worry about it. I get my I I get my religion on Sunday, and that's really not where this needs to go. We rely too much maybe on paid staff to provide better and increasingly engaging worship experiences. And we rely on marketing to bring in new people and to keep those who are now coming in. So I think the next logical question might be, where do we go from here? Where does where does this all lead? And we've, you know, I've got two weeks to go on this, and you know, we're going to wrap this up in a couple of weeks. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at we're going to look at some practical aspects of this, insofar as the church family is concerned, and where where do we as a church family need to start heading? Where do we need to start looking? Where do we need to start going? So where do we go from here? Well, if you've understood even a part of what's been said, you know that what we're talking about here is not a quick fix. It's not something you can do over a weekend. It's not something you can do with a one weekend seminar or a couple of Wednesday night services or something like that. We're talking about a mindset change here and a worldview change, a change in how we think and what we do with the church family. And I'm talking here not specifically to Riverwalk, but I want you to understand there may be some aspects of this in your life or in, River, in the life of the Riverwalk family, but I'm not dinging specifically on the Riverwalk congregation. I'm looking more at churches as a whole here. But our tendency as people, if we're members of a business-like church, is to 
Well, we consider our faith to be a private matter. It's nobody's business what I do when I'm not at church. Secondly, we maybe have minimal interactions with others in our church family, both on Sundays as well as during the week. Thirdly, if we do interact with others, we keep those interactions with the church family on a superficial and benign level. We don't get a little bit deeper. We don't get down into more of the soul type matters. Fourthly, we would shop as a consumer would for a church that treats us as a consumer and provides the experience that we want or think we need. If you remember, I talked about that word experience that I mentioned, especially the Sight and Sound Theater over in Branson, and I'm not digging on them. They've got a good thing going there. But church is not Sight and Sound Theater or shouldn't be Sight and Sound Theater. And then fifthly, we do what we can to attract as many people as we can by whatever means we can. The bigger, the brighter, the louder, the better. Well, I've said that this kind of Christian living is not what I believe God had in mind when he established the church some 2,000 years ago. I've cited the Bible, and particularly in the New Testament, about in my discussion, we've looked at some passages which I think bolster that argument. And you say, well, that's fair enough. We, we, can, we can look at those. I get that the church of the New Testament was different, existing in a different era, in a different culture, a different world. I get that the church of the New Testament functioned more as a family unit. But what do we see in the Bible that asks us, those of us in this present era, this present culture, this present world, asks us to formulate a different worldview, to have a mindset change about how to do church? Well, for that answer, I'm going to a passage in the Gospels that at first glance, at least for me it took a couple of glances, might not seem to have a lot to do with what we're talking about. But let's look a little deeper into it. Let's see what's there. I'm going to be looking at the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. I'll read not all of the chapter, but I'm going to, I'll, but I'll read portions of it that's pertinent to the discussion. John chapter 6. And I don't, I've copied the text down in my notes, and so I don't have specific verse numbers. After this, Jesus crossed to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Jewish feast of the Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy bread for these people to eat? But he was asking this to test him because he knew what he was about to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii would not be enough to buy bread for each of them to have even a small piece. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Here's a boy with five barley loaves, two small fish, but what difference will these make among so many? Well, have the people sit down, Jesus said. There was plenty of grass in that place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. I don't know what the women did, but the men sat down, it said. <laughs> then Jesus took the loaves and the fish, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. When everyone was full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over so that nothing's going to be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had performed, they began to say, Truly, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Okay, let's look at this part of the text before we go further. Put your mind in the business model of the church. Put your mind in the business model here. Jesus is what many would say in these days of the business model of the church at a peak or a high point in his ministry. 
He's flying high. Here on the side of the hill where he, his disciples, and his followers gathered, Jesus has over 5,000 people who are apparently intent on hearing what he has to say, and they have the desire to be part of this group. Let's stretch this just a bit and say that this group is his church. Can we do that? After all, the word for church in the New Testament simply means a gathering of people assembled for a certain purpose or reason. And these are people who are gathered specifically for a certain purpose or reason. These people are gathered together, they're assembled, and that purpose is to hear what Jesus has to say. At this point, they had no idea, as far as we know, that he would also feed them. They just came to hear what he had to say. At the very least, there are many on the side of this hill, in this assembly, who are considering being his followers who want to learn more about this man that they've heard about or maybe even have seen before now whether or not they believe him to be the Messiah of God. They may have heard him teach at some prior time. They may have heard about or even seen one of the more miraculous things that he had done. They may have witnessed him sparring with the Pharisees and the scribes about some religious topic and and liked what he was saying to them. Who knows? But we do know that they are here because of Jesus. They wouldn't have gathered here otherwise. We also know that it's Jesus' intent to, quote, build my church, unquote, as he himself says, to bring the kingdom of God to mankind. We know all of that. Okay, before we go any further, Let's bring this same scenario into the modern world. Anyone today who is intent on starting a church would salivate at the prospect of having over 5,000 people, 5,000 men besides women and children, along with a dozen of his closest associates, already on board for the inaugural Sunday services. Think about it. If this would be the modern day, we wouldn't have to scour the countryside to find one or two to come to services. We already have over 5,000 here in one place. God would certainly be blessing us by gathering this big crowd for us. Wouldn't you think? We could really make some great progress in forming a church with these kinds of numbers. We could make a big splash in the community, maybe even get on the local news or written up in Christianity Today magazine. Our offering would be enough to really kickstart the ministry. We could hire more staff. We could bring in a band right away. We could put up a video wall. We might even have enough money for a smoke machine. I don't know how much those cost. (laughs) And we'll have to find a larger venue right away that can handle what certainly would be a larger crowd even next week. God is certainly blessing us with this crowd. Now let's go back to the first century. That's basically what Jesus had here. There are more people here in this place then we're baptized on the day of Pentecost, as far as we know. And in addition for Jesus, they were all gathered in one place. No need for remote teaching and all that goes along with that. No need to find additional venues to accommodate the crowds. No need for lease agreements, building upgrades, and all that goes along with the large crowds. Jesus had a really good deal here, and he'd found a way to keep the crowds satisfied and wanting them to come back. He fed them. Now think about what this scene would be like if Jesus believed in the business-like approach to church. He would have kept the meals coming, but he would have varied them with different entrees and sides from week to week. 
He would have done progressively more and more miraculous miracles to hold their attention. He would have started programs to keep them busy, and he would have tasked his disciples with starting small groups or some other method of checking on and keeping the people interested. And when he realized they were going to make him their leader as a type A personality who lives for these sorts of opportunities, Jesus would have accepted that role. He may have even thought that this was some kind of inevitable God-ordained place for him and would readily have stepped into that place of authority. God is certainly blessing him with this crowd. He already had the makings of an organization. He had 12 of his friends as his cohorts and vice presidents. He had the support, we believe, of some of the more wealthy women in his life. He was knowledgeable. He was intelligent. He was witty. He knew how to tell a story in a captivating manner that conveyed a truth. He held people's attention with miraculous acts. He seemed invincible against the status quo. Jesus had all he needed to start his own church. Well, if you know the story, you know that Jesus did none of that. In fact, he actually left them there on the hillside without, it seems, so much as a benediction or a closing prayer. He walked away from them. He didn't even take his closest disciples, the twelve, with him when he left. Listen to what the scripture says next. Then Jesus, realizing that they were about to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus rejected all of it. The power, the authority, the notoriety, all of it, and pretty much all the crowd that was there. He went away without even his 12 closest friends to a place of solitude. That kind of thing would have been unthinkable had Jesus been adhering to the business model of the church. But of course, we already know that Jesus marched to the beat of his father's drum and that he often did things that didn't seem to make any sense to us. Okay, let's go on with the text. I think this is verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had remained on the other side of the sea realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not boarded it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. However, some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum to look for him. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, it is not because you saw the signs that you were looking for me, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So the crowd went to look for Jesus where they thought they might find him, and they did find him, and the question they asked him when they found him was never answered by Jesus. Rabbi, when did you get here? He never answered that question. Instead, Jesus tells the crowd that they came to him because they ate of the food that he provided the implication being that they wanted to be fed again. And he tells them to instead desire the food that brings eternal life. Well, this was something the crowd wasn't ready for. Jesus first insults them, sort of, by telling them that all they want from him is more food. Then he tells them something about a kind of spiritual food that leads to eternal life, something that's entirely foreign to the ears of the crowd. They don't get it. They don't understand what's happening here. Okay, let's go on with John's narrative of this event. This betrays kind of a note of uneasiness and restlessness on the part of the crowd. And I'll quote again. At this, the Jews began to grumble about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. 
They were asking, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then can he say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus replied. Truly, truly, I tell you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Well, the people still didn't understand. They continued to talk about physical bread and the manna that fed their ancestors several thousand years ago. Jesus continues to push back, trying to turn the conversation into a spiritual one, finally telling the crowd that he, Jesus, is the bread of life. Had Jesus been doing the business model of the church, he would have, I think, as I said before, probably continued the meals, would be giving them teaching that was easy to understand, and didn't push the buttons in any of the lives of his supporters. Nor would he have so lightly dismissed the crowd's Jewish history of being fed manna from heaven and tried to replace it with himself being the true bread of life. And then Jesus says what brings out into the open the uneasiness of the crowd. He's not gaining any followers here, by the way. And this bread which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. Okay, that does it. Now he's gone and pretty much ruined any chance he has of winning these 5,000 plus people into his church. He's gone off the deep end. He's not just a wonderful preacher. He's a crazy man. He said something so controversial and difficult to understand that the people wonder if they made the right choice by following after Jesus. Quote again. At this, the Jews began to argue among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your fathers who ate the manna and died, the one who eats this bread will live forever. And that paragraph even makes us sort of uncomfortable. Okay, that's it. He's gone and done it. He's turned away by far most of the followers. He's even caused his closest followers in that crowd to question him, to question him. Let's read the rest of the story. Jesus said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum on hearing it. Many of his disciples said, well, this is a difficult teaching. Who can accept this? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this teaching, Jesus asked them, does this offend you? Then what will happen if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and their life. However, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the, begin from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Then Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has granted it to him. From that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Seems from reading the rest of the chapter that only the 12 remained with him out of over 5,000 people. The other thousands went home, no longer followed him, 
Seems Jesus had failed in getting a business-like organization started and going. He had the people. He had the organization. He had the entertainment. He had the hook, the things that would hold the crowd's attention. He had the bells and whistles. All he had to do was satisfy their consumer mentality. They were following him for the wrong reasons. But even if they were there for the wrong reason, if he only would have continued to hold them in somehow, maybe they would have come around to the right reasons in time. If he would have just kept on offering them things that kept them coming to him, maybe he could have taught them adequately so they in time would become followers instead of consumers of entertainment and feel good worship. But he didn't do that. Instead, he apparently didn't spend a lot of time on them. He essentially rejected them and sent them on their way. Does any of this sound even vaguely familiar to you in the modern day? Let me quote from the Church Reset book here. Quote, people who come to our churches because we have advertising that speaks to them and their wants might not be coming for Jesus, but maybe if we keep them coming, we can turn them into real followers eventually. Thankfully, Jesus did not and does not think like us. Jesus knew that if they didn't accept him as Lord, it didn't matter how dedicated they were, they were unfit to carry out his purpose. If people didn't value him above all else, he knew they weren't fit for discipleship. Unquote. Recall that Jesus also turned away the would-be followers who wanted to go back and say goodbye to their loved ones or wanted to go back and bury their dead, Luke chapter 9. He turned away the rich young ruler despite his faithful keeping of the law, but he valued his possessions above Jesus. Look at who Jesus did choose to follow him. Those who dropped their nets, those who left their boats, those who left the tax booth, those who took seriously Jesus' words in Luke 9, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I'm going to quote from the book again. Jesus didn't want customers who liked him for what he had to offer them. He wanted disciples who were ready to take up their crosses for him. Questions, comments? I noticed in verse 2, it tells the main reason that those 5,000 were there. It says, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. And that's why they were there. That's why many of them were there, yes. And my guess is they were wanting to see more of that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with that particularly. It's a good thing to see someone love enough to heal sick people. <coughs> and yet our hearts, their hearts, our hearts are revealed <coughs> on that though. And hopefully some of those people that were there, maybe later they heard more about Jesus and actually did decide to follow him for the right reasons. Yeah, that we don't know. Yeah, we hope they would, but at that point in time they didn't have a heart to follow Jesus. There was one point in time when he was on the cross, how many followers did he have there? Or going to the cross? Maybe John? Maybe his mother? And the thief at his side. The thief? The thief. You know, three years of ministry and he has, what, three or four people? Any other comments, questions? This is why I think us being in this culture, we need to be careful that we don't go with the culture. Like have the, the musicians and have the entertainment because they're coming for a whole different per thing than learning about God. 
So I think we need to be very careful of not going with this culture, that we're just going to have to stay strong. And I thank people, because we were born here and we live on this earth. It's hard for us to realize there's a veil and there's a other whole world with God, the spiritual thing. And I think a lot of people, even when I think it a long time, I get kind of like, wow. But um, a lot of people can't fathom it, that there's another, there's another world out there because they've been born and they live on this earth. So we just have to teach them the word. And if they don't like the word and they want to go their way, you, you Countercultural is the word to use. Um, the phrase "in the world but not of the world" is another is another term to use from what you're describing. Yes. Jesus wanted people who valued him above everything else, rather than valuing whatever else might happen uh, in church or somewhere else. And there are very few, comparatively, who would value him above everyone else and everything else. Other comments, questions? Well, you know, those, those people, they came upon, they did come upon a hard teaching. Of they did. Drinking blood. Because it, it, as a Jew, in that culture, it, when you, if you happened to come in contact with blood, you were set apart from the whole community. Yeah, you were. And, and things. And that was the hard part. You mentioned um, the baptism of the 3,000. That, you know, when Peter, when, when, what I think about is when Peter said, repent and be baptized, they had to turn away from that old law belief. And they had to turn to a new one. And, and they had to turn away from that. And that would be a hard thing to do, too, as we saw where... You know, the followers, well, we know about Saul and his persecution and all that. But um, so, and that's the thing when people come to a, a biblically based church without all the entertainment and things like that, that's a new teaching for them, yeah. too. Because where yeah. they don't have, yeah. where it's, as, as, as for us, it's, it's a spiritual relationship. And, and they're looking at a, what, whatever that is, a, uh, what's the word, temporal <laughs> relationship. It's, it, and, it is, and it is different. It is different coming to a, and being part of a church family that really is a church family and acts and behaves as one rather than what we would call someone in a business model. Uh, and actually that business about... Drinking blood and eating flesh is, as I said, uncomfortable for us as well. If we take that in a literal sense or even close to a literal sense, it's uncomfortable for us to think about that. I was also thinking that <clears throat> for our children who maybe are off, have moved to other states and are looking for a church, that this would be a good, you know, we encourage them to find a church that's biblically based and we also... This might be a good chapter for you to encourage them to read and study as they are looking for a church out there. It seems like people at certain age groups are more conditioned, maybe, by the world to look for certain things in a church. Yeah. Why is Jesus demanding so much commitment here? Where is Jesus heading with this? What's he preparing his disciples for? He's not trying to build up a crowd. When he was crucified, we talked about this a couple of minutes ago, pretty much everyone had left him. On the day of Pentecost, only 120 of his followers were waiting for further instructions, and that was after his resurrection. It's a far cry from the 5,000 men plus women and children who were with him on this hillside when he fed them. Jesus was preparing to send people into the world to build his kingdom. He knew that unless they were all in, following him as both Lord and Savior of their entire beings, their entire lives, they weren't fit for carrying out the goal of kingdom establishment and growth. 
These disciples who were all in established a church just for the purpose of growing a worldwide kingdom. So if we can gather from this story and others that the consumer business model of church isn't exactly what he had in mind, what's the alternative? We may have the five acts of worship down pat. We may be preaching biblical teachings from the pulpit or in the classroom. But if we incorporate the business model of organization, of, uh, we've, we've created kind of an entity that a marketing pro would have designed, and we don't see that in the Bible. Next couple of weeks, we're going to look, as I said, some practical aspects of church and see what we might be able to learn about what Christ may have had in mind for his church. Jay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but one question. I'm at the end. Okay. One question in my mind is, is his charge to the disciples. Uh, I think it's better literally translated, as you go. Right. In other words, this is to be an ongoing uh, part of my life. How I approach you, mm -hmm. how I deal with you, uh, I'm to be a, re a reflection of what he taught. Right. And so I'm, I'm working very hard on, on, you know, attitude daily. <laughs> um, as you live your life, yeah. as you go about your business, yeah. as you do your thing. As you do that, make disciples. Yeah. And it's, it, it's an as-you're-going thing. It sure is.